This is Baghdad to Detroit, the journey of one Muslim to Christ, Grandview Church of Christ in Des Moines, Iowa, September 13th through 16th, 2015. Good evening. Of all the speeches that I've been doing in the past few days, this is the one that I prepared least for, and yet it is the most anticipated one. I mean, I've been giving some classes about the apologetics and what Islam is and why we shouldn't believe that Islam uh, is a way to God and, uh, and, and that Jesus Christ is the way to God. And, and many people said, well, we know, we want to know about your story. Looking at the refugees that are fleeing what Islam is doing to the Middle East now, tell us how did you get out of Iraq? And uh, my short answer was, I ran. <laughs> That's how I got out of Iraq. On April 1st, 2011, a Turkish 737 flew from Baghdad at 7 o'clock in the morning on its way to Istanbul and then New York City. To cross that ocean that thousands and thousands of people throughout history crossed to get to a better place, desperately searching for better lives, to get to know how it feels like to be free and with dignity for the first time in their lives. Right before that flight, I was at Baghdad International Airport reading the Bible. It was an, an emotional time. I quit my job only a few days before that. But I was on a journey in which I was not looking back. And I was reading Jeremiah 51, 6. Flee from the midst of Babylon and everyone save his life. I came with only one bag, enough money for me to survive for a few weeks, half of which I paid my lawyer to apply for my asylum. I quit my job, in which I worked as a civil engineer for eight years back in Iraq, doing water and sewerage projects all over Iraq. The planned part of that journey was a one-week tour in New York City. I was admitted as a visitor. I was among the first Iraqis who applied for a personal visa from the American Embassy in Baghdad since 1990. The unplanned part was everything else. I only had one contact, a poor woman in the Amish country of Pennsylvania. And the reason why I came here is only to feel free for the first time in my life to worship the God I believed in the way I believe is true. Within months of my coming, I met over a thousand people who rushed to call me a brother. I enjoyed an exceptionally good health. And that risky journey that I had, I had no idea whether I will be admitted to the United States, whether my asylum will be approved. Even if that fails, can I go back and go back to my job? or not, all my cares have been taken care of, needs have been taken care of, enjoyed it, and especially good health did not need to go to the doctor. Until nine months later, I started to get paid to be completely devoted to go to school and study the book I had a secret love affair with for over 12 years back in Baghdad. Isn't God wonderful? My name is Wissam. I was born in Baghdad, Iraq. A few months after I was born in 1979, Saddam Hussein became the president of Iraq, one of the bloodiest dictators of the modern history. And Ayatollah Khomeini led the Islamic revolution in the neighboring Iran. We started to have the war between the two countries that lasted for eight years, one man in each nation scared the whole nation. I grew up in the war time 
That was my childhood. I lived in a community that did not know God's word, a whole community that was not told to love one another. Right after the end of the Iraq-Iran war in 1988, Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait in 1990. We had the sanctions for 13 years in which we were living on $1 a month. We had the Gulf War. Right after the Gulf War, there was a Shiite revolt against Saddam Hussein that took an Islamic theme in southern Iraq. Up until that time, Saddam Hussein was not religious in any way. He was a secular military dictator, uh, fascinated by and impressed with and inspired by people like Stalin and Hitler. But after he realized that when he first came to power, he put all the religious authorities to death, that did not work. That did not ban those religious fanatics from claiming uh, that he did not deserve to be the president of Iraq. So after he crushed that revolt in the South, killing tens of thousands of people of his own people, he started to put on a show of Islam. He did not beat them, so he started to put on a show of joining them. So he wrote Allahu Akbar on the Iraqi flag. He ordered the Quran to be taught in all the Iraqi schools before graduation from high school. He ordered the building of hundreds of mosques all over Iraq. And that's when Iraq started to turn from secular to more Islamic. My father retired in 1992 and pretty much did not do anything after that. My mom, a very hard-working woman, started to work as a tailor to mend and fix the clothes of the people in the neighborhood to provide for us, for our family, and for my school. And in the middle of the 1990s, it was very obvious that Iraq was at enmity with everything that is different. And the source of that enmity can really obviously be traced to the Islamic culture that we've had. We've been told that it is wrong to live in peace and in harmony and to love those people who believe differently than we did. And hatred and intimidation was being preached from every pulpit in every mosque every Friday. On TV, in the three government newspapers, and the two government-run TV channels and the two government-run radio stations, we've been told that we were right and everything, everybody else in the world was wrong. That just did not count with me. The lack of satisfaction was inside every person in Iraq. There was a vacuum that we did not know what to fill it with. Some people were too distracted observing the Islamic rituals, praying five times a day, fasting every Ramadan. Those who are financially capable used to go to do the Hajj pilgrimage in Saudi Arabia. And they were looking for answers in the wrong places. We did not starve for food or water because of the sanctions. The socialist government provided us with rations almost for free. But we were starving for another kind of bread and water that we did not even know. In the middle of 1996, my four-year-old sister died because of food poisoning. My mom, a panicked mother in the funeral of her daughter, was begging for someone to provide her with a glimpse of hope that that innocent child went to heaven. No one was able to provide her with that hope, and the only knowledgeable man in the Quran in that funeral told her that she will be judged for the very, very first breath she took in when she was born. That's when I started to think, what kind of God is that? A few months later, my uncle got cancer. I have many uncles and aunts. Both my grandparents had three wives each. That was my favorite uncle. He used to work in the Pepsi company in Baghdad. Was very kind, very generous, very humorous. And when I saw him when he was on his deathbed, he was so sad he did not say a word to me. He would cry every time I asked him a question. Not because he saw his death coming in a few days, which he did die, but because for the first time since he was 10, he was unable to 
go to the bathroom to get ritually clean, to do the Islamic prayers every Muslim is demanded to do five times a day. He was soiling himself in bed and he thought God hated him for that and he died without hope. It was then when I decided that's it between me and God and religion per se. And I rejected Islam and became an atheist. I continued to have that vacuum in me. I felt a good conscience not being a Muslim. I mean, Islam not only does not assure you of salvation, but it actually assures you that you are going to hell to serve a term there. So what's the point? If I'm going there anyway, I might as well enjoy the, the few years that I have here on this earth within the few available options that I had in a poor neighborhood in a poor Iraq. But to satisfy that vacuum that is in me and to get rid of the deception and lie that is all around us, I had to learn English after I came to the radical conclusion that everything that was written in Arabic in Iraq was a lie, censored completely by the government. The internet was banned, satellite channels were banned, and the government only fed us what they wanted us to learn. I had to learn English to know the other sides of the story, started to listen to radio stations like the Voice of America and those other few shortwave radio stations. And I started to read a lot of books. And many of those books that I read in my senior high school years and early college years quoted the Bible. Now, a Muslim is raised to believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God. Belief in the Bible is one of the six pillars of the Islamic faith as we studied a few days ago. But Muslims believe that this copy of the Bible is not the same Bible that we are told to believe in. I was not religious in any way. I was an atheist. I did not care. And I continued to read books, and they continued to quote the Bible. It was then when the first Mission Impossible movie was on, when Tom Cruise picked the Bible. That was the first time I ever got to see the Bible. And I was so curious to get a copy of the Bible only to understand what those books were talking about. So I went to a flea market in Baghdad in my second year in college, and I bought my first Bible. It was the Gospel of John. I thought that was the entire Bible. I did not find any of the quotes I've been looking for. And I was like, Muslims were right. Everybody is writing a different Bible. I mean, who is John anyway? I'm looking for the Gospel that was supposed to be of God and not of John. I did not know anything about the Bible. But some, something caught my attention in the Gospel of John, the way Jesus dealt with the hypocritical religious authorities of his time, calling them hypocrites and liars. Something you're not supposed to do in the Muslim community. You're not supposed to question your religious authorities. You're supposed to blindly follow them into wherever they lead you. Even though, even if they lead you to what they have led the Middle East, that is suffering from what is suffering from now. I identified myself with the rebel Jesus in that book, which I did not even believe. That was my version of Catcher in the Rye. <laughs> did not care, though, threw the Gospel of John away. And in the summer holiday between my second and third year in college, I, of course, went to the College of Civil Engineering, the University of Baghdad. Uh, I was back in that same flea market Flipping the New Testament, I found the Gospel of John in the New Testament. That was the first time I realized that the Gospel of John is not another Bible, as Muslims claim, but it is a part of a bigger book, so I bought the New Testament. A few days later, I realized that the New Testament is a part of another bigger book. I ran out of money, I borrowed money from my cousin, and I bought my first complete Bible. It was a, a, a plain Bible as compared to a study Bible, and it was written in an old Arabic format. The version is called the Smith Van Dyke, which is kind of like the Arabic King James Bible. And when you give the Bible for the first time to someone with no biblical background at all, that never been to church, never heard any quote from the Bible, there is only so much you can expect from that person to understand of the Bible. But I was so impressed with the historical and geographic information 
and the Bible a commodity that does not exist in the Quran. Everybody probably already knows that I'm a history buff. And I was like, wow, the guy who made up this book really knew his history and geography. <laughs> I had some, so many questions, but I did not have any Christian friend of any kind in my neighborhood in Baghdad, which is a, a, a poor ghetto, which is the south eastern suburb of Baghdad, 100,000 people in the 6 million people city of Baghdad. And I did not remember I had any Christian friend in my first two years in college. But when the third year started, I saw a man with a big cross on his shirt. His skin color was different. He was obviously a member of the Iraqi Chaldean Catholic Church, the biggest church in Iraq. So I went to that person. I said, sir, are you a Christian? He said, yes. I said, I got myself a copy of the Bible, and I have some questions. He said, go ahead. I said, do you Christians believe that you are saved by obedience or by grace? He took me aside like he'd been waiting for someone to ask him this question his whole life. <laughs> and he explained to me that God is a just God, and he wants to destroy us because of our sins. But at the same time, he's a loving God, so he sent his son to take those sins on him and to die on the cross for us. And that was the first time anyone tells me the theme message of the Bible. I said, I have one more question. He said, go ahead. I said, I know that the smartest part of the world is, is too educated to believe in a made-up book, but do you really believe that the Bible is not corrupt? He said, yes, we do believe that the Bible has not got undergone corruption. It is the word of God. And we believe in that in, in, in our testimony and in our tradition. And we've been reading that uh, book uh, for a long time. And we have a lot of historical evidence that tells you that the Bible has not undergone corruption. The next day, he brought me some literature that talks about how many tens of thousands of manuscripts we have of the Bible and the museums today from the different parts of the world, written in different languages, all of them match each other. And that was the first time anyone tells me that the Bible is true. And I was so happy that the book that I started to fall in love with, a book that has the solution to every problem that my community is suffering from, a book that preaches values like love, tolerance, a book that preaches hope is actually true. And I thought everybody else will be as happy as I am. I was wrong. <laughs> Conversion from Islam is a no-no. I wish I can have that excitement that I had when I first believed in the Bible. I am a gospel preacher now. I tell or I preach the gospel to some people who never heard of the gospel before, including Muslims. I have converted some of them. I tell them every time they convert to Christ, I wish I can have the enthusiasm that you have now, which I had back then when I first believed. That, that initial thing. And that fire that was in me to, to just tell everybody, hey, look what I found. I found the solution to uh, all your problems. The first person that I tried to share the gospel with was the person that I loved most, my mom. My mom used to wake up before me to prepare breakfast for me, even to the very last day before I came to the United States. She spoiled me. And that is not always good because I had to learn how to cook here in America. I used to read for my college classes in the kitchen. And I used to read the Bible and then hide the Bible among my college books like my parents are too dumb. They will not find this out. At that time, whenever I come to the kitchen and I would say, good morning, mom, she would not answer. Mom, what's wrong? I would see tears in her eyes and she would turn to me and grab me by the collar and tell me, Please tell me, what did I fail to provide for you that you do this thing to me? I said, what thing? She said, I've been re seeing this thing among your college books. You've been reading this blasphemous book. You want to bring shame and danger on the family. Look at yourself. Grow up. With that, 
with the lack of encouragement, lack of wisdom, lack of knowledge on what to do and what's not to do. With the fact that I lost many of my Muslim friends after they found out that I've been reading the Bible and did not gain any new Christian friends. And especially with the fact that on one day in the summer of 1999, a sheikh, who is my aunt's husband, uh, a Muslim preacher, knocked at our door. And he said, Sheikh Sabah, and that's another sheikh, the most prominent Muslim figure in our neighborhood, is standing across the street and he wants to talk to you. And I knew why they came. And I was so scared. I crossed the street and I stand, stood in front of Sheikh Sabah. I said, hi, he did not answer. I said, what's the problem? He said, our master Umar, that's the second successor after Muhammad, found a man reading the apocryphal scriptures, talking about the Bible, and he told him, throw it away, for God has replaced us a better Quran. I said, okay, what does that have to do with me? We always try to imagine, will we have that faith when someone comes in and points a gun at our heads and tells us to renounce Jesus? Well, this man did not have a gun in his hand, and, and, and he was nice to me, and I still renounced Jesus. He said, I've been, I heard that you've been reading the Bible recently. I said, yes, I have been reading the Bible. He said, why do you read the Bible? I said, well, I am an educated man. I just like to read about history and, and see what other people's believe. And he said, so you don't believe in that? I said, no. He said, good boy. I need to see you in mosque every Friday. I said, yes, sir. And that was the time I really thought it was not a good idea in the first place. Where are you, God? Am I the only Christian in the world? Why is this happening to me? I threw away the Bible. And it took me only a few weeks to realize that the hope and the satisfaction that I had when I believed in, the Bible, in God's promises in the Bible and claimed them as my own cannot be replaced with the whole lie. So I brought a new Bible in English this time so that no one would understand what I'm reading. And I continued to read the Bible in secret for the rest of my life in Iraq. The biggest discouragement, though, came from the fact that I learned only a few days after I read the New Testament that if you wanted to become a Christian, you had to be baptized. I went to every single church building in Baghdad trying to get baptized in vain for 12 years. Many of those people believed that you had to be baptized to, be, to become a Christian. My aunt's husband was a teacher in the Islamic Academy in Baghdad, and he was shot by the Iraqi police in 2004 in a shootout. They thought that he was a terrorist because he had a beard. He was not a terrorist. My school friend who told them that I was reading the Bible, a, an arm dealing gang came to assassinate him, but they mistaken him for his brother, and they shot his brother, and he was arrested by the Iraqi police, and he was put in prison until I came to America. And Sheikh Sabah was shot in 2006 by a Shiite militia. And the people that I was afraid of are dead now. And I am talking about the Bible and preaching the gospel. So I finished college in the year 2000. I finished my mandatory military service as a Republican guard in 2002. The American army came in 2003. Uh, a lot of things changed. We started to have the internet for the first time. Uh, I was looking up things like Bible things on the internet, downloading songs and, and, and sermons and upload them to my MP3 player and listen to them on my way to work every morning. Uh, in fact, the, the, the second thing that I ever downloaded from the internet was eSword. And, and I got so hooked up to it, I did not even update it. The, the, the version that I have in my computer now that I'm using to prepare my sermon is still that same. I mean, what do you expect a single guy in his like 23rd year when he sees the internet 
for the first time, what would he download? The second thing that I downloaded was eSword. Everything continued to happen at the same pace until that morning, and I hope the video works here, in October of 2009, when I was working as an engineer at the Iraqi Ministry of Public Works, making a phone call, I was on my way from the second floor to the first floor when this happened. A truck bomb rocked the Ministry of Public Works where I used to work. A second truck bomb rocked a second building only a few hundred feet away, which was the Baghdad City Hall. I was in the middle of that pillar of smoke uh, that was caught by the Iraqi soldier that was standing between the two explosions. I was in the staircase. 1,500 people got either killed or injured because of those two explosions. I came out of it without a scratch. We moved to a substitute building in another neighborhood in Baghdad. And that other building had an internet cafe next to it. And I used to go there, and that was in March of 2010. I used to pay a flat rate to use the internet for an hour, and it didn't take me more than a few minutes to check my email and things. And, 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 and then I would be like looking things uh, around. And at that time, I was already familiar with the Bible, reading it every day, praying every day, downloading sermons and listening to them on my way to uh, uh, work every day. But I did not have an official Bible course to finish. So I Googled for a free Bible study, and I chose the first hit. And everything changed after I chose the first hit. And I signed up for freebiblestudy.org website, which, by the way, did not look like that back then. I'm not sure if this has a, a, a light pointer. But later on, I translated the course into Arabic, and I took a picture of the editor of the website baptizing his own daughter with my cell phone camera. A woman was assigned to grade my Bible tests. Her name is Susan. She would be the only contact that I had when I came to America. And she said, do you have any prayer requests? I said, yeah. Would you please pray that I can be baptized? I've been trying to get baptized for 12 years, but I'm in Baghdad where we don't have a baptistry in every street corner. And would you please pray that I can live in a Christian-friendly community where I can just say Jesus is Lord without getting shot right on the spot? That same day, I was looking for free Christian books. I came across a book called Bible Basics, written by a British man by the name Duncan Heaster. I ordered a free copy of that book gave my mailing address. He answered me with an automatic email message introducing himself and his ministry, and he said, and I believe everyone should be immersed in water to be forgiven. I said, I appreciate that, sir, but I'm from Iraq. Read the address. He said, I'm coming to Iraq and baptizing you. And on May 26, 2010, this British man came all the way from Latvia, where he has a ministry, to northern Iraq, paid for my bus ticket to go from Baghdad to northern Iraq and baptized me in a bathtub in a hotel. And I do not like this picture because it added five pounds to me. <laughs> the woman that I was communicating with used to take care of a quadriplegic man in a Christian man's house in Boyertown, Pennsylvania. She told the owner of the house about me. He told her if that Iraqi plans to come to the United States, tell him there is a room in my house waiting for him. That woman was the only contact I had when I came to America, and I stayed in this man's house. And I stayed in this room. I quit my job packed my bag, said the final goodbyes to my family, came to this country, was admitted as a visitor. I stayed for a week in New York City, then took the bus from Port Authority in Times Square all the way to Reading, Pennsylvania, where that man and woman were waiting for me in a rainy day. They took me to live with them in that house. 
I applied for asylum. The government did not answer me. The government answered me right away with a letter that tells me that it is legal for me to stay until they decide my situation. And, and, and that took longer than I expected. The money that I brought with me was getting less and less. My work permit was not issued. And, 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 and I uh, had no idea what's going to happen to me so much I was looking at the return ticket. And then one time we had a hymn sing in Reading, Pennsylvania, where I met the first member of the Lord's Church. And he heard about me and he said, come over here, young boy. What brought you all the way from Baghdad to the Amish country? I said, a plane. <laughs> he said, no, tell me your whole story. And he would be the first person who ever hears this story that you are hearing it now. When I was done, he said, wow, you have to share that story in my church. I said, sir, I have never spoken in public, not in my second language. And only a few months ago, I could not even go to church without raising unnecessary suspicions. He said, you'll have to testify to what the Lord's been doing in your life. And he arranged for me to speak at Camp Hill Church of Christ in Pennsylvania, the preacher of which is Douglas Hamilton from Iowa. When I was done, Doug said, you need to go to a preaching school. I said, me, a preacher, are you kidding? He said, you have it. You will have to go to preaching school if you like the Bible. I said, I don't even know if it's legal for me to go to school in America. And, and, and I don't enough, have enough money to survive for days. By the way, I was sent to school at the time when I ran out of the last dollar that I brought with me from Iraq. He said, you go check with your lawyer and we will start raising support money for you. My lawyer sent a letter for free, which is not typical of lawyers to do, <laughs> to Sunset International Bible Institute, telling them that he risks guaranteeing that it is legal for me to go to school, even though there is no uh, clear law that says that. He says people who come on a student's visa are legal to work, so people who are eligible to apply for a work permit are legal to go to school. And he said, I will write this letter and, and, and sign it, and, and that would be the legal thing. And before I knew it, I was at Sunset International Bible Institute on my first day in school, in front of the school's chapel on January 5th, 2012. My work permit was issued on January 6th, 2012. Somebody up there did not want me to work in any other job. The dean of students was asking me, the new student, what are your plans after you graduate? Like I've been planning to be a preacher my whole life. I said, what plans? How did I end up here? <laughs> and then I remembered that for years and years back in Iraq, when I was reading the Bible in secret, I was praying every night just to have the freedom of reading the Bible in public and do that thing that you are doing now without fear. Just be able to go to church and, and, and listen to a Bible study, a class, or, or, and sing and pray and have fellowship with other people. And in return, I'm going to serve God for the rest of my life. Every Christian has a, a talent, a gift that we are expected to invest in God's kingdom. And my gift happened to be my Arabic and Muslim background. So I told him I plan to take the gospel to the Arab and Muslim communities in the United States. I was the least expected student in the school to be hired or employed by a church, being single, no home congregation, being from Iraq, uh, no family. And then we had a substitute teacher, Jerry Tallman from Michigan, who told me, do you have any idea how many people up there who have been praying for a man with your background to come and work with them? Five years ago, I was dodging bullets in Baghdad. And now I'm dodging bullets in Detroit. <laughs> Five years ago, I could not even go to church without raising unnecessary suspicions. And what scared me was not only what was outside the church, it was the Christian community and those churches themselves who would see me as an Arab and they were like, and they would whisper to the preacher, what does that Arab man doing here? And now I have my name on a church sign. Five years ago, I was so scared, I used to hide my faith. And now I am claiming it in front of whole community. Look at me deep in the eye and tell me that God does not exist. 
Once I finished school, I reluctantly went to Metro Detroit, Michigan, where I have been a preacher there for over a year and a half. This Saturday, I am doing the biggest and the first one-time outreach event of the Lord's Church to the Arab and Muslim community anywhere ever in what is called the Feast of Christ. There is no explanation to what's been happening in my life in the past five years other than the providence of God through the love of his people. I have not taken a cent from the American government because I've been completely taken care of by the Lord's Church. The first thing that I promote when I talk about the Lord, when I talk to the non-Christians about God and about his church, the first thing I talk about is the love that the church has for those people who come into it. Are you happy if you're not a member of our church? Do you think that your co-workers or, 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 or your teachers in school love you more than your uh, fellow Christians? I couldn't go to church, and now I'm a minister in a church, and none of the things that I've been doing in the past year and a half have been possible without God's providence through the contribution and the generous support of Christians all over the United States. What I have been doing has not been free. It has been paid for by brothers and sisters like you. The very small contributions Everything that people invested in that ministry went to preach the gospel among Arabs and Muslims in a place that claims to be the biggest Muslim community outside the Middle East for the first time, the true gospel, in a way that started to have a powerful presence among the other denominations that's been there, working there for decades, but they have not been teaching the true gospel and telling people about the true Jesus. I really enjoyed the past few days among you. As I have said over and over, it is very hard not to fall in love with the people of Iowa. I really appreciate you taking the time to uh, listen to all those classes, taking the time to come over here to learn about Islam so that you can be better equipped in taking the gospel to the Muslim communities and to educate your own families so that none of them would come out and say, I'm a Muslim, or I believe in Islam, or I sympathize with ISIS. What you're doing is not only for the Lord's kingdom, not only because you've been commanded to do that, but as we have talked yesterday, our battle is a spiritual battle, and it starts with you. The military and the political solutions are not the only solutions because the root of the problem is an idea, and you cannot fight an idea with weapons alone. Pray for the ministry, support the ministry, and let's stay in touch. Most, uh, if not all of you, already have my contact information. If you have Muslim neighbors and, and, and people that uh, you want to reach out uh, with the gospel message with, I will always be there. I have been in touch with... Uh, all the members of the congregations that I've been speaking at in the past. And it is really humbling to have that front row seat and look at what the Lord is doing in the Arab and Muslim communities. I really appreciate your time with me here. Thank you, and may God bless your night.